So as we start our study this morning, uh, we are going to be in Romans chapter 10. Uh, we're going to hopefully um, uh, conclude these particular uh, verses, verses 8 through 13. And the name of the uh, study, the, the title, is Whoever Believes on Him Will Not Be Put to Shame. So I'm going to start out by uh, reading our scriptures, Romans uh, 10, verses 8 through 13. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's our study this morning. That's the body of scripture that we're going to try and get through. And as we have been continuing to listen to what the Apostle Paul has written to those in Rome that are of the church, those in Rome that are saved, uh, those in Rome that are, if you will, they were called the way back then. <clears throat> Paul is doing a duality here, if you will. He's speaking to those who are the Lord's, and he's speaking to those who do not know the Lord. And in that, it's a very important thing that we, we understand that as our lives are lived as unto our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we need to be very careful about the things that we are putting forward as we live our lives for the glory of God. And when I say that, it's, it's not so that we can justify our salvation. It's not so that we can earn or work our way uh, towards our salvation. It's for the very purpose of why we've been saved, to magnify and glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are sinners. Now, I know a lot of the church would kind of go, what? What, what did he just say? No, the redeemed, the saved, we're sinners. We're saved by grace through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, we're still sinners. And as sinners, we can still bring forward those works of old, those things that uh, we shouldn't ought to do, whether it's our countenance, whether it's um, the things that we uh, physically do, whether it's uh, verbiage that we bring forward, and what Paul continues to bring forward to uh, the church and to the unchurched is the fact that you need Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You need salvation through him and him alone. There is no other name by which a man might be saved. And it is so important to Paul that he is spending his life pouring out upon the church to the glory of God and because of the glory of God. And when, when you understand that his very breath, when he understands that his very breath is God-breathed, his very heart is God-driven, his very life is God-centered, then you understand how we as the redeemed should be acting, how we should be living our lives. Now, <clears throat> does it mean that as fully committed Christians, that God is a cosmic killjoy and we can't ride Harleys? Ah. Does it mean that God is, is, is wanting us to give him the preeminence in everything? Does it mean that we can't go on fishing expeditions? Ah. No, it doesn't mean any of those things. It means that we can partake fully in life as long as we take partake fully in him. We can bring those things to the table in our hobbies, bring those things to, ta to the table in our workplaces, bring those things uh, to the table in our communities and our fellowships that magnify and glorify his name and give him the preeminence. And, and that's what Paul is continuing, I believe, to bring forward in our verses today. In the verses past that we've gone through, and the verses present, and the verses yet to come. <clears throat> I'm 
I want to read uh, out of Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, and just focus on some of the things that Paul said prior to our scriptures this morning. Romans 9, verses 1 through 5, speaks of Israel rejecting Christ. He says, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain. So listen to the litany of, of checkoffs, check, check marks that Paul puts uh, 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 in place about the Israelites. He says, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. So he, he, he does this series of, of recognition of who Israel is, who the Jews are, yet in that, uh, apart from Christ, they have nothing. They are nothing. They're simply a group of folks that existed, whose names were written in history. They're simply uh, individuals who existed, whose names are written in history. And their impact on history is such as that now they are put in a juxtaposition with, with the Christians, with those in the Old Testament who were saved by faith, our, our forebears, our forefathers in the Old Testament. And, and you have a, a group here the redeemed of the Lord, and a group here that uh, could have seen, could have had, could have known, all the evidence was before them, yet in their self-righteousness, they declined the righteousness of God. And, and that's, that's the tragedy. Our, our next set of verses that I want to go through before we get into our study is Romans chapter 9, verses 30 through 33. And this is the condition of Israel when Paul wrote this book of Romans. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained a righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So, so the whole aspect of belief, the whole aspect of faith, the whole aspect of understanding uh, redemption through the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, those things, those things could have been known. Those things were written about Old Testament. Those things, if, if hearts hadn't been hardened, eyes hadn't been blind, ears hadn't been, they, they could have been known by the Old Testament saints as they transferred it into their transition into the, the New Testament. But as we're told in verse 33 of Romans 9, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So, so it's recognized that, that Jesus was a stumbling stone to some, a rock of offense to many. Yet, yet whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. It's, it's that aspect of faith. And that's why I think it's so maddening for me. I don't know about you guys, but... So maddening for me when you talk to somebody about the goodness of God through the giving of his son, Jesus Christ, so that they might have eternal life in Christ. And it's so maddening when you're brushed off or when you're, you're, you're not listened to or when it's, yeah, I'm glad you got that crutch, brother. I am so glad that, that, that you have that need of Jesus Christ and that crutch. You know, I don't got that, brother. I'm doing good on my own. I am absolutely going forward in life. And, you know, that, that old song, 
the case or off or all, whatever will be will be. I'm all good with the whatever will be will be thing. But but for you, you got that false hope, you got that false security, you got that false Jesus. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna knock you. I'm just not going there with you. And the, the problem is is it becomes absolutely confusing as to someone uh, who is absolutely going to hell in a handbasket could refuse delivery from hell in a handbasket and simply go their way. And so you continue to love on them, you continue to pray for them, and you continue to uh, hope that uh, that stumbling stone, that rock of offense, is removed by the grace of God. And then finally, in Romans 10, verses 1 through 4, the a couple of weeks ago, we, we talked about this. This is Paul's heart for his brethren. Uh, scripture says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, the law was the taskmaster. If you will, the law was the fence that kept us in the field uh, so that we couldn't or wouldn't or shouldn't want to go astray. But, but unfortunately, many of us were fence climbers. In fact, probably all of us were fence climbers. Many of us not only learned how to to go over the fence of the law, we learned to dig under the fence of the law. We we simply got to that point where we were so um, crafty in our ways that we could explain everything away. You know, we were we were better than that guy. We didn't do what that guy did. We certainly didn't speak like them. I mean, so right. So I got to be that much better before God than than this whole group of people that I surround myself with. I think they know it too. I think they know that I'm a pretty righteous guy. And, and unfortunately, what happens is you you walk in your self-righteousness, you deny the Christ righteousness that, that the Lord would have you to have, and you walk forward and you can't keep the law. You can't be perfect all the time. And in that, you, you fail in one law, you have broken them all. And there goes the self-righteousness of man. And so Paul continues to go forward and want to take and embrace his former brethren. He wants to go forward and bring the truth of Christ and Christ crucified. And he does this passionately. And as we start our study this morning in verses 8, 9, and 10, let me read what it says. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It is that simple. It's that easy peasy. It's that not only simplistic, but it's that powerful that that moment of salvation, when it sweeps across you, when God guts you and cleans you and gives you that new man, he creates a new man in you, that it should absolutely take your breath away. I remember phoning Janet, and I knew Janet back when I was a pagan, and Janet knew me back when she was saved, and she knew I was a pagan. And she kept me at arm's distance as far as the things that she should have, and she ministered to me and the things that she should have uh, ministered to me, and, and very thankful for that. And I remember, um, I remember phoning, and I said, I did it. And she's on the other end of the line. Well, what did you do? And I said, you know, I did it. And, and I was just, I mean, baby, baby Christian. I, I was saved that moment on the road to Via de la Valle down in San Diego. That moment, never forget in my life, the, the grandest, greatest 
bestest, if I could use that as a grandpa moment in my life, above any other, there will never be another moment as grand and as glorious as that moment. And I can say that. There will never be, no matter what that is. There will never be anything that will um, replace that moment or supplant that moment. And so back to talking to this woman who <clears throat> knew me as a perfectly good practicing pagan. I said, I did it. What did you do? So, and it says here that if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, and it goes on further to say, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I didn't want to bring that out. <clears throat> it wasn't that I was embarrassed. I just didn't quite know how to verbalize it. She goes, what did you do? I accepted the Lord as my Savior. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was on the other end of the line. There. The next morning, I was in Temecula at the old Stater Brothers and uh, family that I used to hang out with. Um, and they weren't unsaved when I hung out with them and I was unsaved. So we made perfectly good pagan, um, um, you know, relationships there. Well, I remember I went in the, remember distinctly, the far left-hand door at Stater Brothers. And I saw this person get out of the car and go through the far right-hand door of Stater Brothers. And so I'm like trying not to because she was saved and you know, I'm just still working my way into this new skin and everything. And so I heard from the right-hand side of Stater Brothers, hey, Bill, I heard it. I'm like, no, I heard you got saved and she yelled it at the, the top of her voice. And then it was like, oh, you're right, Faye, I got saved. Yes, and I had to say that pretty loud too. I am saved. And what, what Paul is saying is the word is near. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. It's, it's, it's by faith that we receive the gift of salvation, the grace that God has given us. Reading out of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we might hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it that you may do it. Read out of Joel chapter 2, verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So past, present, the future, the string that runs through the entirety of the canon of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, the beginning to the end of the, the present and through all of eternity is by faith they shall know. By faith they shall be accepted. By faith they will understand the glory and the goodness of God toward them through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Matthew Chapter 10, verses 27 through 33, Jesus speaking. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Let's stop there for a second. And I'm going to say this, and, and it might sound prideful. I don't want it to sound prideful. I just want it to sound factual. I fear no man. I fear no man at all. I don't fear what a man can do to me. I don't fear what a man has done to me. I don't fear what might be coming down the pike. 
I fear God. And I live in awe and reverence of God. And if you can live in awe and reverence of God, you will fear no man because the only way a man can touch you and afflict you and deal with you is through the allowance of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if he allows it, he's got to have a plan. He's got to have a purpose. There's got to be something in here. And so, so reading the scriptures, going back to Matthew 10, um, verse 28, it says, And do not fear those, Jesus speaking, who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. See, that's, that's the issue. That's the problem for the unsaved, the unredeemed. The Lord is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. There's two zip codes. One is eternity in the presence, and the other is eternity called damnation. That's it. Only two zip codes. There's not a fence in between. There's not a negotiation afterward. It's not a, hey, do I get a do-over? <clears throat> it does not happen. Continuing in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, Jesus speaking, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will? Listen to that. The, the, the sparrows are sold for practically nothing, which means they're almost virtually worthless, which means who really gives a rip about sparrows, right? But, but listen to what Jesus said. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Is that incredible? Verse 30 in Matthew 10, Jesus still speaking. <clears throat> but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father. Reading out of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the, the name of Jesus every knee should bow and of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. There is a lot of pride going around today, and I don't mean that as a double entendre there. There, there is a lot of pride that's, that's floating through the air, floating through the verbiage, floating floating through the, the manners of men. But what we need is humility, not the sense of pride that everybody is pounding their chests over. What we need is to be able to humble ourselves before the Lord, drop before him, confess our needs, confess those things that we know that we're struggling with. Perhaps others don't, but God does. There is there's no secret closet where you can hide from God. If you got one, just redeem the space, give it to your wife or your friend or whatever, and let her use it for knickknacks. And I've given up that. There's no secret closet you can hide because God is in every secret closet that you think is secret. Confess, repent, go forward. Uh, give those things over to the Lord and bow before him. Just get rid of the self, not righteousness, get rid of the pride and humble yourself before the Lord. Closing out uh, this morning, verses 11, 12, and 13. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put 
the shame. Have you ever been in a meeting with a school administrator and the meeting is like, you know that it's a preloaded meeting. I won't go into the, any explanation with that. You know that there is some type of agenda going forward and it is not your agenda. You know that there's a point that's to be had at the end of this assembly of uh, employees. And you sit there and this administrator asks each and every person in the room after they've already taken and uh, set the landmines that they want you to step on. Why are you here? Well, this person explains. And all these are good, valid reasons. I'm not uh, minimizing any of them. They were heartfelt. They were, they were intelligently given reasons. Well, why are you here? Well, why are you here? And we all listened to what we said, just not everybody in the room heard what was said, if that made sense. Uh, they, they, I believe, listened to words going back and forth, but they didn't listen to what really the people were saying. And so this particular administrator got to me and said, Mr. Bill, why are you here? That I'm here because of God and him alone. No other reason why I'm, that I'm here other than my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's got me here. Talk about silence. Talk about the other foot falling. And it, and it wasn't done in anything other than that's the only reason I was there and I'm still there. When God says go, I'm gone. He says, stay, I stay. He says, figure it out where you're at. I'm figuring out where I'm at. And, and I don't say that in a way other than to encourage us that he will not put you to shame. If you confess his name before hostile troops, he will not put you to shame. If you step out and you bring forward what's in your heart, truly in your heart, he will not put you to shame. And that's what Paul is getting at here, for Scripture says, whoever believes on him, trusts him, has faith in him, will not be put to shame. And, and more salvifically than anything else in this verse, but, but in the entirety of our lives of those already being redeemed, uh, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And Paul further broadens it out in verse 12. He says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is it in a nutshell. It, it doesn't have to get any more complicated than that. I love apologists. I love theologians. I love the great men of God who utter two sentences and I just simply go get an aspirin because my head hurts. I mean, I love those guys. I don't minimize them. I don't dimension, but for me, it, it comes right down to verse 13 of chapter 10 of Romans, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Don't let the minds of men complicate salvation for you. Don't let the minds of men say, oh yeah, brother, but what about that? I, I know you confess with your lips, and I know you believe with your heart, and I, and I know that apparently God, yeah, I don't know how he did it either, but apparently he might have saved you, but what are you doing about that? What a travesty, what a, what a boatload, what just a boatload of junk. And we have to understand that, we have to realize that it's not what we can do, it's not what we have done, it's not how are we going to keep this, it's Jesus Christ was obedient to the point of death. He was obedient to the Father, the will of the Father. And in that, verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to read out of uh, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, and I'll try and read quick. This is as Jesus Christ ministers and witnesses to a man called Nicodemus, a man who was the head honcho, right? He was the chief chipmunk in the, um, in the leadership of Israel of the day. And 
Scripture says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you were a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Jesus speaking, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So addressing the dilemma of Israel, the dilemma of the Jews, you guys are born of the flesh. You think you're getting to heaven by everything that, that you do, everything that you say by your uh, lineage, by your heritage, and, and that is, is not so. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, you guys. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone who is born of the Spirit, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Then Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, so Jesus speaking, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how you will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who was in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How complicated is that? How mind-destroying is that? It, it's not. The simplicity of the gospel, because we were created in the image of God, yet we are finite. He's infinite. He understands how the brain works. He understands how the pride thing goes. He gets it. Jesus Christ walked with us for 33 years, right? He understands what we're all about. I'm going to read verse 17 uh, as I continue in uh, John chapter 3. And we need to take this to heart. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, the world is already condemned. And in that, the condemnation is, is self-applied, self-inflicted. Self and, and the unsaved know what is going on. The unsaved know what they have need of, yet they will not bow. Verse 18, John 3, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not come to the light, least his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in the book. So as the worship team comes up, this morning, as we end our time together. The gospel in Paul's day was pretty simple. The gospel in the garden was pretty simple. The gospel tomorrow is going to be pretty simple. And if the Lord tarries and doesn't come back for us for a few moments more, in the future is going to be pretty simple. The only thing that gets in the way of the gospel being preached accurately, passionately, and purposefully is men wanting to take and just confuse other men at 
for you. They, they want other men to know that, yeah, there's, come on, brother, there's no free chicken dinners. Yeah, you, you can't tell me that this, okay, so, okay, so you did that. But what about my list of things that I want you to do? Are you doing those? And what I would tell you is if you run into somebody that has a litany of things that you should be doing to justify your salvation, to um, keep your salvation, to actually get, get saved, I would take and beat feet and go the other way as quickly as you can. It's about the grace of God through faith and that faith being in the cross of Jesus Christ.